Hey everyone, I'm Melissa from Knitting the Stash, and this is episode 129 in the series. Welcome back to the Yarn Room. I'm excited to be up here with you guys to spend some time on this Sunday afternoon. We're waiting for some thunderstorms to roll through, hopefully later today, so uh, I was hoping to get this episode filmed before all the rain comes pitter-pattering on our metal roof, which usually makes quite a commotion up here in the Yarn Room. So far, so good. So we'll see if we can make it. Uh, I have a kind of action-packed, exciting episode for you as always. I have a finished object. Have no fear, the sweater will finally be finished. This is the one I knit twice over, basically. It is Nacre by Emily Lewis, and I'll talk all about that one. I also have uh, a fun historical spinning knitting section about this question of the term grist, and uh, that actually came out of um, our Zoom session yesterday, so thank you to Louise for asking the question. I did a little research and I'm hoping what I found will be of interest to you all. Uh, and I have a shop update for you um, and a class update for you, so things are in the works. It's been a busy time around here at Knitting the Stash. <laughs> uh, let's see, what do I usually tell you at the beginning? Uh, you can find me just about everywhere as Knitting the Stash, uh, especially over on the website knittingthestash.com, and that's where I host the uh, Flock Farm Yarn Shop, which is a shop that features small batch yarns from around the United States, so small batch producers where you can read interviews with the shepherds and shepherdesses and and check out uh, the different fibers that they're using uh, to produce their yarns and it's just a it's been a really fun project for me to be working on I've met so many wonderful people and I have an update for you about that one that I'll give you in just a second over there is also where you can find all my teachable classes and links to all my tutorials that are on YouTube and over on Teachable. I have some free stuff, I have some pay stuff. Um, so if you're interested in taking a class with me online, that's the best place to do it. Uh, right now we're hosting the first to fifty-first sweater cal, uh, and that's where the um, that's what we were doing on Saturday. We were zooming at about two o'clock Eastern time. So if you're interested in getting in on that zoom, you can email me at knittingthestash at gmail.com. And it's been a wonderful group over there, people coming and going, but there's a core of people that come back every Saturday, and I love getting to know them and hearing about their projects and the successes and everything that's going on. Uh, we also have a Ravelry thread associated with this cal. So I think we're going to go another month or two. We usually have a year for our cals, and we're, we're heading into September, October is usually when I switch things over. So that Zoom and cal is still going on if you want to get involved. Uh, and thanks to that <laughs> meeting meetup yesterday, uh, Louise uh, asked a wonderful question about grist, and that's what I'm going to talk about in this historical segment of the podcast today. And I was realizing when Louise and I were talking that um, we've known each other quite a long time now. She mentioned that um, she thought my son was looking kind of older at this point. And it's true, I think, back when I started the podcast in 2017, he was much younger, maybe 12 or 13. So anyway, it's been a long time. And Louise, I've got some info for you, so it's going to be a fun one. Uh, let me give you a quick shop update and class update. So those of you who have been following along with these sweater cloning class updates that I've posted over on IG and then I've been talking about it on here on the podcast, that class is going to be I'm starting the filming next week and it should be the first lesson or so should be up in about a week's time. So if you're interested in a sweater cloning class where we look at sweaters from our closet, from big box stores, heirlooms, things like that, Maybe they're worn out, maybe they need an update, maybe you just want to remake them for somebody else. Uh, that cloning class will allow you to do that. It'll give you the skills to look at a sweater, figure out what's going on, and then make it for yourself again. Or modify it for yourself again if you feel like it. Uh, and if you want to be on the list and in the know when that class is going to come out, you can get on my newsletter sign up over on knittingthestash.com and that's how you'll get info about everything that's new in the shop and new classes that are coming out and things like that. So I'm pretty excited about that class and I actually went thrifting the other day to find some more sweaters because I've been pulling stuff out of my closet but it was really fun to go thrifting and find some new sweaters to look at and wonder about and kind of pull apart and think about and I actually found two wool sweaters, 100% wool sweaters, at the thrift store. And that is always like a thrill. Those of, you, those of you who know, know, right? It's a thrill to find 100% wool sweaters. So, and maybe in the next podcast or so, I'll pull those out and we can have a look at them. Uh, they're pretty, uh, really interesting, actually, kind of beautiful, and they actually fit. So, hey, you know, I get extra wool sweaters, or I can use the yarn. Either way. So that's exciting. 
And as far as the Flock Farm Yarn Shop update goes, I have some new yarn in the shop from Georgia Rustic Wool. This is Joanne Mackey's uh, yarn, and Joanne Mackey has been in the shop almost since the beginning. I have plenty of her other yarn over there too in the natural white. Uh, I have some beautiful uh, kind of like tan or umili alpaca over there. I have some sock yarn. Uh, now jo Joanne Mackey's in Georgia and she runs Georgia Rustic Wool and the two new yarns that we have are an alpaca blend. This is 35-65 uh, alpaca and Gulf Coast native and if you've been following along with um, Joanne Mackey's story from the beginning you know that uh, the Gulf Coast native sheep is a critical breed and uh, so having that yarn in the shop means a lot to me because I really want to help with conservation of these really cool breeds. Uh, so yeah, so this one is alpaca and Gulf Coast native. It has a good weight to it. I think it would be perfect for accessories. Uh, might not be great for sweaters because it's a little bit of a heavier yarn, but we have plenty of other Georgia Rustic Wool over in the shop that would be perfect for sweaters, including this new one. This is the uh, a rare breed combo. So this is Rommeldale CVM and Gulf Coast Native pulled together. And we talked about Rommeldale CVM in here a couple episodes ago. This one is in a beautiful oatmeal color. It is a fingering weight yarn, uh, very fine, beautiful, lightweight, good for sweaters. And I think my next sweater is going to be out of this. So I'm kind of excited. I don't know if I'm going to design a sweater or just pick up a pattern, but either way, this is what I think I'm going to be knitting with uh, for the next little bit. So I'm kind of excited about that. Uh, it really is a beautiful uh, kind of like, not quite woolen, but it has that kind of lightness of a woolen yarn. Uh, and it has, I always forget to give you the yardage, this is 100 grams for 400 yards. And the alpaca blend is 100 grams for 200 yards. So it's much more of a worsted weight um, kind of yarn. And this one's much more of a fingering weight kind of yarn. So those are the two new ones in the shop from Georgia Rustic Wool. And I'm so lucky to be in this nice partnership with Joanne Mackey, who's always sending yarn for the shop and I love it. So, so head on over to the shop and check out those yarns and any of the other yarn uh, that's available. We have yarn from New Hampshire and Iowa, Illinois, Colorado, Georgia, uh, I'm forgetting somebody, Cami of uh, Montana. So yeah, we're starting to, get a lot of yarn from all over the country in that shop. And that's the Flock Farm Yarn Shop over at knittingmustache.com. So without further ado, let's jump into the finished object before we do some knitting history and language stuff, which will be fun, I think. Uh, so this is the Nacre sweater by Emily Lewis. And I think it came out pretty recently. I talked about it briefly on the last episode um, when Spencer was on. And I think I had re-knit this down to about here at that point. This was a sweater that I'm not sure still what exactly happened. I think I just misjudged my sizing and I didn't quite wash my swatch and I didn't do all the things that I normally recommend you do. I was just kind of like getting through the motions and like doing some TV knitting and I was like, oh, stock and that will be good. I'm good on my swatch. Anyway, I was wrong. So I had knit all the way down to here and I think I had to pull out all the way back up to somewhere in the yoke. Lesson learned once again. <laughs> First or 50th sweater, doesn't matter, you can still make mistakes. So I had to reduce the, I think I had about seven extra inches of fabric around the circumference and I'm very happy that I went back and reduced it and got the right sizing because now it just fits perfectly and I'm very, very happy with it. So this is a sweater that's knit from the top down and it has some very thoughtful shaping uh, that happens up in the upper yoke. So we were talking about a compound raglan yesterday on our Zoom session and a compound raglan, a, a regular raglan kind of just cuts straight across here and it's not always flattering for a lot of adult bodies. We've talked about that in here before. A compound raglan uh, kind of weaves an S. So you get, uh, let me see if I can pull my hair out of the way. You get more rapid uh, increases or decreases here and then a slower rate of decrease and then uh, sometimes you get, get it finished off with a different rate of decrease under the arm. Uh, so you get kind of an S shape rather than a straight line for your sweater. Now this sweater doesn't quite have compound raglan shaping, but it also has a little bit of saddle shoulder going on. It has a little bit of fully fashion going on. It's just a really, it has an interesting look to it. So up here, you can probably maybe very barely make out the uh, increases since it's a top down sweater are more rapid here 
and then they kind of like drop off a little bit here and then completely drop off for the underarm. So you get this little bit of an S curve, but it also has this kind of what looks to me to be almost like a saddle shoulder. Pull it down here so you can see. So the just like a like a raglan or a saddle shoulder, you have this continuousness of the of the pattern here, which is a right here. It's a kind of stockinette plain stitch, but it has a nice look to it because you have those increased rows kind of surrounding it. So there's a little bit of a saddle-like shoulder going on, and it almost looks like it has. It produces this effect where it almost looks like it has this fully fashioned shaping in the back, where you just have the shaping right here that lines up, kind of sits over the back of your shoulder. Uh, along the uh, back of the collar. So it's just a very flattering yoke, and I like the way that Emily Lewis designed um, the look of the sweater. It was one of the things that drew me to it. It is a Henley, so it does have the, um, you know, basic Henley placket. So you have your um, bind off, or you can do a provisional cast on here uh, for your placket stitches. And then uh, in this case, the button band is not horizontal but vertical, which is very interesting. And I'm not going to give away the secrets of the pattern, but it does produce a kind of beautiful effect on the sweater to have the vertical button band, I think. And thanks to Spencer, the sweater has buttons. <laughs> I'm not a button sewer on her. I've done it several times and I've had some mixed results. It's one of those things I really like. I, I want to focus on a little bit more and figure out, but I'm not a seamstress sewer and I'm not a button. A fixer. So luckily I have Spencer in the household and he loves doing both so I happily turn my sweaters over to him. <laughs> he actually has a hilarious video up about the last time I did a vertical button band and he sewed the buttons to that. So if you're looking for that, if you need a little splash of humor in your day, check out that video over... Um, it's on it's on my channel but it's Spencer sewing on buttons. He's got some tips for you. It's kind of funny. Uh, so we've got Henley styling top down and it's a very basic plain stockinette sweater. I didn't do any shaping or anything, um, but I did add my split hem to the sweater because I just, I like the effect and I really like not being squinched in any kind of pullover with a ribbing at the bottom. So yeah, I went with that. Now it has a pretty short band of ribbing at the bottom. I kind of like it that way, but the cuffs do have a little bit, I gave them a little bit more um, length in terms of the ribbing, and then this ribbing up here matches the uh, bottom. So I like what in sweaters have a certain kind of proportion to them, like if these two match up, the hem and the collar, or if the hem and the cuffs match up, I just feel like it's a nice, it's nice to have a balance kind of there. Uh, and this one is almost twice as big as this. So I like a little proportion, a little balance in my sweaters. That's one of the things I look for <laughs> in a pattern. If it's not in the pattern, I'll add it. So, so there you go. Uh, it is uh, knit out of this beautiful uh, Bichet Boucher yarn. So I could not access the yarn that she used, which was a French yarn, beautiful French yarn. If you are in France, you are in luck because it's a beautiful yarn. Uh, so I use the Bichet Boucher uh, Petite Lambs Wool in this color. This is the blue gray. And I use their uh, petite silk and mohair in the same color. And you can see it's interesting with yarn, uh, the same color can be applied to different yarn. So this one is mohair and silk, this one is wool, and you get a slightly different effect based on the fiber type and the dye used. So they're very close. They are called the same color and they almost are the same color. But you can see the mohair has a little bit of uh, like, it's almost like a resistance to the dye, so you get a little bit more of the lighter or the whiter undyed um, portion in there as compared to the wool. So they're both the same colorway, uh, but you get a little variation, which gives the fabric of the sweater a really nice variation as well. And it has a beautiful halo and drape um, from the mohair, but it also has uh, some good elasticity and memory because of the wool. So that's why I like this kind of combination. You hold these two together and you get the best of both worlds. Um, and I talk about the um, ideas behind good yarn substitution in another video that's up on YouTube. So if you're looking to substitute yarn, I have like five tips for you over there on that video that will hopefully help while you are trying to substitute your yarns for your next sweater or sock or shawl project, right? Uh, what else would I say about this one? 
It was actually a fairly standard kind of classic sweater and I didn't do too too many mods to it. I did a provisional cast on for the underarm stitches. We all like a good armpit, right? Uh, so I did a good provisional cast on here so there's no um, seam there. I like seamless armpits as well. Uh, and I just, I really wanted to have, I'm trying to build, and maybe some of you are too, trying to build this wardrobe of sweaters that are a little bit more classic lines and kind of like wardrobe staples let's just put it that way right so it's really fun on the one hand to knit sweaters that are kind of wild and crazy and do interesting things and create new uh, opportunities for learning new techniques and things like that but there's also something to be said for knitting a classic sweater that you can just pull out and put on it's fun to have these handmade sweaters that just have a kind of a look like they're professionally finished or they just came out of like you know a beautiful boutique or something like that there's there's something nice about that it's a good feeling um and one thing i do love about this pattern um that emily louise put together is that she uses things like um tubular uh cast-ons and italian bind offs and ways to really finish your fabric so that it has the look of a, a beautifully kind of professionally finished sweater so you can see the Italian bind off here creates a rounded edge on the cuffs and same with the hem and that the tubular uh, cast on creates a really rounded beautiful finished uh, collar so and I, and I worked all of those uh, even on the button bands like I said they were worked vertically but I used that same uh, that was interesting actually to use the Italian bind off right next to the tubular cast on and make them look the same so that they would actually uh, line up and I think I'll be able to show you that. Yeah. So you can see right up here and over there that uh, the upper portion of the sweater is done with those two different techniques. So yeah, it's a cool sweater. It's really cool. And I'm excited to have it as a kind of staple in the wardrobe. So I'll hopefully have some photos that I can pop in here for you to see. And yeah, so that's my finished object. This is the Nacro sweater by Emily Louise. And I'm pretty happy with the way that it turned out. Uh, and if you've been working on sweaters, especially for the cow, or just if you're new to the podcast and you've been working on a sweater, throw some comments down there. Let us know what you're working on, um, what your favorite sweaters have been, and what you're struggling with with your sweaters, because it's always fun to share those kinds of things and then see if we have some, some help in the, uh, in the comments down there. So in this last segment of the podcast, I want to totally nerd out with you, all right? And if you are ready to nerd out, this is going to be your segment forever, all right? Louise asked me a question about grist because I talked about the term in my yarn substitution video. Grist is defined as yards per pound, generally. And Louise in the Zoom yesterday was like, I wonder where that came from? Because grist, you know, a lot of us, when we think of grist as a term, we think of like a grist mill, like grinding corn, right? <laughs> uh, we don't necessarily think about yarn. Now, if you're a spinner, you've heard this term. Pr I'm pretty sure you've probably heard this term because Grist is one of those, well, I mean, Rachel Smith calls it kind of one of the secrets of <laughs> the spinning community. And it's the secret to getting the yarn that you want for a project that you're going for, like knowing how much raw fiber you're going to need um, pound wise and the kind of yarn that you're going to produce to be able to know how many skeins you need, how much actual yardage, all that kind of stuff. So it's kind of like really important to spinners who are trying to spin for a particular project. All right. So I, <laughs> in my day job, I'm a professor. I can't help uh, but love a good research question, so this took me down some rabbit holes, <laughs> and I thought I would share some of the research with you. Now, this is by no means the you know, be-all and end-all of like the history of the term grist, uh, but when you ask an English professor to go figure out a language, like what's going on with language and what's going on with the term, this is what you get, so <laughs> bear with me. All right, so yes, grist, uh, if you go to the OED, which is the uh, Oxford English Dictionary, often my first stop when I'm trying to figure out the history of a word or a history of language, if you go to the OED, you do find one definition that has to do with grinding up corn. But you also find a definition that has to do with uh, the size or thickness of yarn. All right, so they're both happening at this at, in the OED, not at the same time, using the term grist for talking about corn grinding or mill grinding of corn goes way back to like uh, 1080 or something like that. I mean, it's just very far back. Using the use of the term grist for yarn applications 
doesn't really catch on until about the 1700s. And what you get in the OED is usually the date when something, a term is first used in print, right? So it could have been used in oral languages before this, uh, or more casually before this in language, but it, it was noticed in print at the time that the OED is talking about it. So in 1733, in a Scottish publication, we have the use of the term grist. And actually, and this is where we totally nerd out, <laughs> it wasn't grist, it was gerst, G-I-R-S-T which got translated over to grist by the time the British are using it for a patent uh, in 1792. Okay, but the 1733 use of the term, they say, they give you a little snippet of the text, a certificate from the master of the workhouse bearing that he or she, the bearer, is a sufficient tradesman or good spinner of such a staple or grist of cloth or yarn, etc., etc. So this is the first time that gerst or grist is being used in text, it's in a Scottish context, and like I said, it doesn't switch over to grist totally uh, until a little bit later in the 18th century. Now, that led me down a little bit more of a rabbit hole because I'm thinking to myself, I still don't have the answer of like, how do we get from corn to yarn? <laughs> so I found um, a reference to gr grist in the Journal of the Textile Institute, which is a journal I've been using in my other research, so I was really happy to see it show up there. Now, this is from a 1952 publication uh, that's in the Terms and Definitions Committee section, it's like a report that they put together, uh, and it's called Notes on Grist, Luster, and Dumb Yarn. We're gonna have to come back to dumb yarn at some other point. I'm gonna stick with grist right now, but dumb yarn is an interesting term. So when they get to grist in this uh, Terms and Definitions Committee, they n note that it is a Scottish term. They think it came from Scotland originally, and that's what we saw in the OED. That's what they saw in the OED. Uh, and basically they think it's used to, uh, it's the equivalent of the count, the grist or the count of a yarn. Uh, and by counting, we're talking about those, those same kinds of things that we were talking about before, like yards per pound is what grist generally means to spinners. and we're still talking about the same thing, but we're just using different terms here. So we're talking about grist might mean the count if it's used in um, England rather than Scotland. Uh, and then they go on to all this kind of pretty interesting specific language about the cut and lees and, and all kinds of other terms. So this led me down an even further rabbit hole. So I was like, what are we talking about with the cut? And so it turns out that there were tons of yarn measurement systems going around on around the world. And it actually became such an issue that by the late 19th century, early 20th century, we had a couple of different meetings, like international meetings, to try to figure out how can we take all these different yarn measurement systems and all this different language that's being used, and can we like can we bring it down a notch and just say like we have some universal terms? I don't think that's actually totally happened yet. But it's interesting to me that we had so many different yarn measurement systems going on up until the late 19th, early 20th century. Of course, we're talking about industrialization coming in, we're talking about uh, issues with woolen and worsted spun, we're talking about people being worried that they're being um, cheated out of uh, goods if someone's giving them yarn but they're using a different measurement system. We're just talking about a lot of different things going on at this point. Um, so really fascinating history. And there's a website called sizes.com. I know it sounds really weird that there's just a website called sizes.com, but they have an entire segment on materials and yarn in particular and a lot of the different measurement systems. And by the time I got to that site, <laughs> I got to maybe what might be an answer to Louise's question. So on that site, they talk about um, this earlier moment when yarn was measured by the number of grains that it, you know, grain, weight of grains, certain number of grains to weight of yarn. And I was like, maybe that's the answer. So that's as far as I got. I have no idea if that is actually the connection between the grist and the grist or why those two terms, why the same term is used for both instances. It could just be a weird coincidence in language. Who knows? But that's, that's where I got to. <laughs> so what I'm going to do is 
put a lot of the links that I used below in case you feel like nerding out as well. Uh, there was a great article that I didn't even talk about um, by David Jeremy uh, called The British and American Yarn Count Systems, a Historical Analysis. Fascinating. And there's an older book from, I think it was 1900, by Thomas Woodhouse called Yarn Counts and Calculations that you can get as a Kindle edition on Amazon, if you're interested. So I'll put all that information below. But if you're at all like me and you're a total, like, nerd about these things, you may also wonder, like, what else is going on with these yarn measurement systems? What is dumb yarn? What is a lee? Uh, what does it mean to have a cut system with slashes? And there's a lot more to learn. So if I dig into this any further, I will let you know on a future episode. But I hope you enjoyed going down this strange rabbit hole with me. Thank you to Louise for the question. And although it doesn't totally answer or provide an answer that might be 100% satisfying, I hope that just the act of going through the research and hearing these interesting historical stories might be worth the time. So there you go. So thanks for hanging out with me again today on the podcast. Uh, it's always fun to take a few minutes and sit up here in the yarn room with you. And I will be back in a couple of weeks with some more projects and fun stuff. If you are interested at all in the upcoming sweater cloning class or uh, if you want to be one of the first to know about new yarn that's showing up in the Flock Farm Yarn Shop, hop over to knittingthestash.com and sign up for the newsletter. And that's also where I send coupons and all kinds of other fun little bits and bobs. So you'll be in a good spot if you snag a place on that newsletter. In the meantime, I hope you all have some fun knitting and spinning and doing whatever it is that you're crafting on uh, in your spare time. And I will see you in a couple of weeks. Take care. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.